one of you, and some of you I've known for some time, and I lived, used to live in this area. I, when I come back to visit Sarah, I always find it very uh, interesting place that I lived until I was uh, in my 20s, growing up in Homedale, New Jersey. How many know where Homedale, New Jersey? It's like, oh, good, good. I, I forget where I was talking to somebody out in Yonkers. I was in Yonkers. And I said, they knew New Jersey. And I said, you know where Homedale is? No, 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 no. So it's the Garden State Art Center. Let me call something else, PNC Forum or something along that line. But anyway, good to be uh, here tonight with you. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews. I know you're going through the I Am's of John's Gospel, but uh, we're not going to do that tonight. We'll take a little break. Uh, from that, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 5. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm from an older generation. I know I look pretty young, I don't look that old, I still look like I'm young, but I'm an older generation, you know, and there's a few ways you know that you're an older generation, I'm told that at least, that uh, when you text people, you use proper punctuation, you know, periods and capitals, and that's what I do, I send the text to Cyrus, proper punctuation. Well, you have to, Yeah, well, yes, and I can't spell anything wrong, I'm not sure, everything is just right, uh, when I, uh, <laughs> Send text to her, to Alan for the story, but to, to Sarah. But uh, but also when, when you speak, when I would come to speak somewhere, almost always, you know, I have a dress shirt, I have a dress shirt now, and always have uh, dress pants. But I left my dress pants in Yonkers. So for the first time, I think in the history of my life, I'm wearing blue jeans to speak. And I said that to Sarah, she said, that's no problem. That's no problem. You can wear shorts, you can wear whatever you want when you come to Fifth Avenue. I'm not sure that's correct. I'm not sure that's true, but, um, but anyway. Uh, so here I am, if you see me walk out with my blue jeans, don't, don't say anything. Make me, make me feel bad uh, about that. But um, we're in, a, we're in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, and... Uh, it has, has struck me, and maybe you have studied Hebrews recently. Maybe you're familiar with the book of Hebrews. But Hebrews chapter 5, just to the end of chapter 4, and into chapter 5, and chapter 6, and chapter 7, and chapter 8, and chapter 9, and chapter 10, almost all of chapter 10, have to do with one particular subject. And that subject is the high priestly uh, ministry, work, and position of our Lord Jesus Christ. So six chapters, almost six, uh, part of chapter four, uh, six full chapters of the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews thought it was so important that, uh, that he, this ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, this position that he has, uh, is so important that he's devoted six chapters to it. Some chapters very long. And uh, so the question is, why is this so important? And um, how much do we know about the priest, the priestly work of the Lord Jesus Christ? And uh, and for me, to be honest, for me, I could say that I haven't heard many messages. I've been a Christian since about 1979, and I haven't heard many messages on the high priestly work of the Lord Jesus. And I have heard messages, but not many. When you consider all the the, the devote all, all the, the the space of the book of Hebrews devoted to the subject, and so tonight we're going to look at it. We're not going to look at all six chapters. Uh, we're only going to look at a few verses of chapter five. But uh, I hope as we look at it, it'll be uh, it'll be stirring, and important, important to you, and you'll appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ even more. We're going to read the first nine verses of chapter five in a few minutes, but I first want to give an idea to you, a thought, uh, and it's probably much more than what I'm going to share at this point, uh, but why? Why is it important? Why is this, why were six chapters devoted to the high priestly work of the Lord Jesus? And uh, number one, I think is because of chapter 9 and chapter 10, because of the, of the, uh, the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary, which is part of 
in this high priestly ministry uh, that he had. In the Old Testament, uh, the priests, and in the days of the Lord Jesus, the priests uh, would offer the same sacrifices over and over again, we're told in chapter 10 of Hebrews, that can never take away sin. But it says in Hebrews chapter 10, I think verse 12, it says, but this man has offered one sacrifice for sin forever, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What an important part of the ministry. If that was all that the Lord Jesus was going to do in his priestly ministry, that would be enough. That would be tremendous. So we have chapter 9 and chapter 10 uh, about this aspect of the Lord Jesus. So you have that, that high priestly work, the work of the Lord Jesus, the finished work of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But we have another ministry uh, that I think is crucial, and that is the ministry of the Lord Jesus as a sympathetic high priest. You know, the high priest in the Old Testament were to have, were to have a sympathetic, were to have a ministry of comfort and compassion and uh, teaching and ministering to the people of God in such a way, the reason for that sympathetic compassion of high priest, what chapter 5 says, calls these high priests compassionate high priests. The reason for the compassion of the high priest was to bring them closer to God. They were that bridge. They were, they were in contact with God, and they would bring those ordinary uh, Israelites in a closer relationship with the Lord Jesus, whether it be teaching, whether it be a sacrifice, whether it be example, but they would bring the Israelites closer to the Lord Jesus, to God the Father, to Elohim, to God uh, in their relationship with him. And in doing that, I love one of my favorite verses um, is uh, in the book of Daniel, it's chapter 11, verse 32. It's, it's not like John 3, 16. Uh, it's probably a verse that you're not that familiar with. Most people aren't that familiar with it. It, uh, it in fact, was the basis, I don't know if anybody here has heard of the book, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's the basis, that verse is the basis for that entire book. And uh, the verse says this, the people that know their God are strong and will do exploits. King James says, and do exploits. Other translations say, do great deeds for God. So that's the role of the high priest, to bring the Israelites into a closer relationship that they might know God and be strong. And then they would do exploits for God himself. And so what a wonderful ministry. The, the death of the Lord Jesus, the offering of the Lord Jesus as that once for all perfect sacrifice for sins, once for all, and then a sympathetic high priest that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at that tonight. We're going to look at three aspects of the, uh, the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus. So with your Bibles in front of you, we're going to read verses 1 through 9 in chapter 5. Now in these verses 1 through 5, speak of the ministry of a high priest in the Old Testament. Not of the Lord Jesus, but of what the high priest was to do in the Old Testament. What his role was. What was his qualifications. And so, he, so we have the, the writer of Hebrews outlining that for us. And then he begins to take that and he begins to speak of the Lord Jesus as a high priest. And he takes those four items, four qualifications, and he speaks of three of them. Of the Lord Jesus. And we're going to primarily look at those three qualifications of the Lord Jesus. But let's first of all, I'm going to read one through nine, and then uh, have a brief word of prayer, and get into our, our passage for tonight. Verse one: Every high priest is taken from among men, is ordained for men in the things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant 
and them that are gone out of the way. For he himself is compassed, compassed with infirmities. And by reason of this, he ought for the people, and also for himself, offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor unto himself. But he that is called of God, as was Aaron, so also Christ glorified not himself, but he made himself uh, to, to, uh, to be made a high priest. But he, God the Father, he said to him, God the Son, thou art, a, thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And he said in another place, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, speaking of Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him out of death, when he was he was heard because he had righteous, had right, he had reverence for God, God godly reverence. Verse 8. Though he were a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So I mentioned in the first part of this, of this chapter, we have four items, four qualifications of an Old Testament high priest. And uh, I'm going to mention, I'm gonna, uh, mention them to you. The first one was he had to be taken from among men. And it's very clear in verse 1, every high priest is taken from among, from taken from among men. And the second thing that we have about the Old Testament high priest is he had to be appointed by God. No one takes his honor upon himself. As Aaron was chosen, so a high priest is appointed by God. And then it says that the high priest was sympathetic. It's a sympathetic, compassionate high priest. In verse 2, it says a high priest who could have compassion on the ignorant and them that are done out of the way. And so this was one of the roles of the high priest. You don't see it very much in the Old Testament, but this was one of the roles of the high priest to be a sympathetic, compassionate high priest to those who had gone out of the way. We think from among men, he was appointed solely by God, he was compassionate, and then he offered sacrifices for sin. That's what this Old, this old Testament priest would do. And then the writer of Hebrews, as we move on into these verses, verses 6 through 10, he takes three of these and he develops them. And the three that he takes are this. That the Lord Jesus Christ is appointed by God to be a high priest. He's a sympathetic high priest, and he's a high priest who is the author of eternal salvation. So we want to look at these three things tonight, and uh, hopefully we'll end on time, and there'll be no crying babies, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do just fine. Look with me in verse 5. The fact that Christ was appointed by God. Verse 5. And so Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he was, but he that said unto him, but God the Father said to God the Son, Thou art my son, today I have, I have begotten thee. Now this is a, a phrase that is used a number of times in Scripture. We come across it first in Psalm 2. We read it here. We read it in a number of other places. Chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews, we read about it. It has different meanings, one basic meaning. And that idea is the Lord God the Father has appointed Christ to be something. We see uh, in one passage it speaks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the role that he would have. And we see in, in, uh, in chapter 1 it speaks of the deity of the Lord Jesus. But I want to suggest here 
in verse 5, it speaks about the fact that Christ is appointed as a high priest by God the Father. It says so beautifully, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. He speaks about this appointment, and then he speaks in verse 6 about this appointment after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 6 says, And he said also in another place, Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. We read about him in Genesis chapter 14. And Abraham came back, he met Melchizedek, and he offered tithes unto Melchizedek. And we read in that chapter how he was someone higher than Abraham because Abraham offered tithes unto him. In fact, he gave him the top, the top of all the spoil that he, came, that he had when he came back uh, and met Melchizedek. But we don't know very much about Melchizedek. We don't much know much about him in the Old Testament. We read about him in chapter 14 of Genesis. We read about him in Psalm 110. And in the Old Testament, is that all that we know about Melchizedek. We read about him here in the book of Hebrews. And the most information we have about Melchizedek is in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews. So just, just turn over to that passage for me, with me for a moment. Chapter 7. And it says in verse 1, this Melchizedek was a king of Salem, a priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, and offered sacrifices. Verse 2, whom Abraham gave a tenth part, first being interpreted a king of righteousness, and also a king of Salem. King of Jerusalem, King of Jerusalem, and a King of Peace. But then verse 3 is most of the information we have about Melchizedek. Now, as we read this, I want to ask you a question as, we, as I read it. Is this a Christophany of the Lord Jesus Christ? A Christophany is an appearance in the Old Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have theophanies uh, where God uh, comes and is an appearance of God in the Old Testament in another form. Is this a Christophany? Is Melchizedek a Christophany of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is this Christ appearing in the Old Testament? So let's think about verse 3 for a moment. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, King James says descent, but without genealogy, having neither beginning of days or end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, he abideth a priest continually. <coughs> I would suggest that this is not a Christophany. And for one basic reason, I really think it's a, a, a real genuine person, where he came from, who his father and mother was, no one knew. They didn't know where he came from, mother and father. Apparently, maybe they didn't know when he was born or when he died. But it says in verse, in verse 3, notice the reason, I think, one of the major reasons, I think it's not a Christophany, because it says he was made like unto the Son of God. The writer of Hebrews might have said, this was the Son of God. <laughs> but like unto, in a comparison to the Son of God. But the key about, back in chapter 5, verse 6, and chapter 7, verse 3, the key about Melchizedek is this. We read the last phrase of verse 3. He is a priest, he has a priesthood that abides forever. The Aaronic priesthood, if I were to ask you when it ended, it probably ended, I want to suggest that it ended roughly 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. It may have continued a little further on than that without a temple, but basically about 70 AD, the Aaronic priesthood ended. 
The Lord Jesus was a Aaronic priest. We would not have a high priest any longer. But he's, he is a high priest that's of an abiding ministry to us. And so when we go back to chapter 5 and verse 6, we see the Lord Jesus is appointed, and in this appointment that he has, he has an abiding ministry to us. And how wonderful that is. As we read in chapter 7, in verse 25, it says of the Lord Jesus, He ever liveth. He always lives to make intercession for us, those who have come to God through Him. He has an abiding priesthood. You know, we may not realize it today. There was probably there was some time the Lord Jesus was ministering in prayer in some important aspect in your life today. You probably don't realize what it was. I don't realize what it was, but he was he was praying for you. He was ministering to you. He was drawing you closer to himself and to God the Father. He was ministering as that ever abiding high priest. What a tremendous thought. The Lord Jesus ever lives and has his abiding ministry as a sympathetic high priest. He's had that once for all sacrifice which we benefit from, but we daily benefit from the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in chapter 5, it says he is appointed a high priest. When a person, whenever someone's appointed throughout scripture, whether it be a king, or whether it be a prophet, or whether it be someone who God is going to raise up to minister for him in this world, in Israel, or in the New Testament era, it means that God's hand of blessing is always upon that person. When God chose David, his hand of blessing was upon David. And he would prosper. And he would be a powerful king. And God's hand was on the prophets of the Old Testament. They would prosper in their ministry. They weren't perfect. They made, they made mistakes. They had failures. But God's hand was upon them, and they had blessing in their lives. When it goes to the New Testament, we see the same thing. When God raises up people like Peter and the Apostle Paul and others, when God's hand is upon them, there's blessing. And I want to say, for each one in this room, when God's hand is upon you in whatever ministry, you have a ministry. I think every one of you has a ministry in some way. You may not have a formal ministry. You may not have a recognized ministry. You may not have a title, probably don't have a title. You're not an elder, you're not a deacon, you're not a Sunday school teacher, you don't have any title. But God has raised you up and appointed you to be something. And in doing that, you will bring blessing. I have a good friend Maybe some of you know him, maybe you don't. He was a missionary. He's a missionary in handbook. When I was a missionary in Belgium, he was uh, very important to me. And uh, I still talk to him. We, uh, we have uh, Facebook uh, telephone calls. And uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I can call him. And it's 10 o'clock at night where he is in Belgium. And his name is Hank Kelly. And uh, there's, uh, there's an assembly history, called that the world may know. It's out of print. Occasionally you see volumes here or there. Uh, I have a number of volumes. Don't have that whole set. I'm sure at CML they probably have a whole set, but very rarely do you have to see an entire set. But if you were to go into the, the, the volume on Western Europe and go to Belgium and read the little page, about a page, on Hank Gelly, Never went to Bible college. Never had formal theological training. Was a, uh, was a dairy farmer from uh, Canada. He uh, would drive in his milk transport. He wanted to be the richest dairy farmer with the largest amount of cows, uh, dairy cows in Canada. And he was very young when he owned his farm and began to be a dairy farmer, but he would drive every day past the sign. 
The son said this, what shall I inherit? What, what shall I, uh, uh, what shall a man inherit if he gains a whole world but loses his own soul? What shall a man gain if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? So that every day, drove past that every day. The Lord eventually led him to the Lord Jesus Christ, and eventually the Lord raised him up and sent him to Belgium. On that page in that book, you'll see that it says this. That through his ministry from about 1975, probably only about 10 years of ministry, 900 people were saved and baptized in that province. Now, I saw that. I saw part of that. So I know that was real. God put his hand on him, and he saw tremendous blessing. And I think that's what happens. We don't all see that. We don't all see that conversion fruit for a blessing. But when God lays his hand upon us, we see blessing. Maybe discipleship blessing. Maybe a mother or father. Whatever it may be. Whatever your ministry that God has raised you up. When God lays his hand upon you, he, he appoints you to a ministry. There's blessing. I remember hearing, either hearing or reading, about Billy Graham. And uh, he said something like this. If God was to take his hand off of me, my tongue would turn to star. That's true, isn't it? If God would ever take his hand off of any of us, of these great leaders, great appointed, appointed leaders, their ministry would come to naught. It would end. God's hand upon us. Pointing us, we see fruit. So we see here that the Lord Jesus Christ was appointed, but we see he was a sympathetic high priest. We read about him in verse 7. It says, In the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications, supplications means strong crying. Crying with great emotion, great feeling. With prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears. We have first, I think we have the, the sympathetic ministry of the Lord Jesus. The prayer ministry of the Lord Jesus. You can't miss this when you go through the Gospels. You can't miss seeing the prayer ministry of the Lord Jesus. You can go to John 17, you see the Lord Jesus praying for his disciples. You see in John 17, those who would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, praying for them in this tremendous way. You see him praying so many three times. Luke's gospel has the most occurrences of the Lord Jesus' prayer. When the disciples saw the Lord Jesus praying, they said to the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 11, Lord, teach us to pray. Now that would have been a, a, a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? Think about that sometimes. If the disciples who had heard, many of the religious men going to, to uh, synagogue, they heard many people pray. But when they heard the Lord Jesus pray, it's like they never heard anyone else pray before. My wife, um, my father was Bob Gessner. And uh, I may have heard some of Bob Gessner's books. And, Bob Gessner was an elder in the Allentown Chapel, and uh, he had a number of very excellent books, and I happened to inherit some of them. And I inherited a two-volume set. It's a classic set, probably worth very many dollars on Amazon or on eBay. But uh, I forget year, what year it published. But of the life of, um, of Hudson Taylor. Two wonderful volumes. But in there, and also in Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, when you go to the end of that book, he speaks of his prayer life. He speaks about when he came back to Great Britain and he would have prayer meetings uh, in China, and some people who were praying <coughs> said they never heard anyone pray like Hudson Taylor. <coughs> See, Spurgeon was a great preacher, Neil Moody was a great evangelist, but they said that Hudson Taylor was a great man of prayer and publicly praying. But the prayer life of the Lord Jesus was remarkable. It's tremendous. And we see that over and over again. 
We see him, he prayed for the Lord as, as, he, as he prayed for Peter. He said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as weak, but I pray for you that when you are turned around, that your faith fail not, and you turn back again. King James, when you're converted, strengthen the ground. Pray for Peter. So many times of prayer for different ones, we see the Lord Jesus, even there on the cross, praying for the malefactors. Isaiah 53 made intercession for the transgressors. So the Lord Jesus had this sympathetic ministry of a high priest, and he continues that sympathetic ministry of a high priest. But look with me at the last part of verse 7. I think the first part has to do with his sympathetic, compassion ministry as high priest, but probably the whole, the context of the whole verse has to do with the prayer life of the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he prayed with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him out of death and was heard in that he had godly reverence. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 26. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Every gospel except the Gospel of John speak about uh, the Lord's praying in Gethsemane. It's really a remarkable thing that what is said about the prayer life, how the Lord Jesus prayed as he considered going to the cross that lay before him. Here in Matthew 26, it says in verse 38, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. He says to his disciples, Tarry here and watch with me. In Luke's Gospel, it says, being in agony, the Lord would then pray what we have in the next verse. In Mark's Gospel, greatly amazed, very depressed, exceedingly sorrowful unto death. What amazing language we have of the Lord Jesus before he goes to the cross, just as he contemplated the cross, what it would be to bear the sin in his own body on the cross. And then we read in verse, in verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Drop down with me in verse 42. He went, he went away again a second time and he prayed. He said, oh, my father, if this cup, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And then it says he prayed again a third time. Now, some people look at the first part of this prayer where it says, let this cup pass from me, this cup of judgment, this cup of divine wrath that would be laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned each one to his own way. The Lord, God the Father, laid on God the Son the iniquity, the divine wrath and judgment of us all. I really love Verse 6 of Isaiah 53. One of, the, one of the things that are so beautiful about it is that it speaks of unlimited atonement. You notice that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way. A general statement about the lostness of all mankind. And then the responsibility each one has had to turn their own way. Each one has turned to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of each one of us that would ever live, past, present, and future. 
be made provision, provision for the salvation of every one of us. Some look at this verse and say, did the Lord Jesus somehow not want to go to the cross? Did he want to somehow find it out, find a way not to go to the cross? I don't think that's it. I was looking at some comments, some other commentaries today about this. And almost all of them say the same thing in one way or another. They say here, the Lord Jesus had the natural recoil of his humanity from bearing, from going to the cross and knowing what the cross would entail. And he's speaking from out of his humanity. But in the same verse, he prays from out of his deity. You know, the Lord does that in Scripture. And if we don't see that, we'll be kind of confused uh, when we read through Scripture. Sometimes the Lord speaks from out of his humanity. And it would be impossible to interpret that from his deity. On the cross of Calvary, he says, I thirst. Deity would never thirst. Never slumbers, never sees, doesn't have any of these characteristics that we would have. But in the same verse, chapter 19 of John, it says, knowing all things that shall come to pass. Well, that's deity. In humanity, none of us know all things that shall come to pass. We love to know all things that come to pass. But we don't know that. The Lord Jesus sat down by a well at Sychar and was tired. That was his humanity. But here, the last word, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, there's a great lesson. There's a great lesson in, in this prayer life of the Lord Jesus. The prayer life of the Lord Jesus, there was a certain amount of this humanity which said, if it be possible, let this come pass from me. Now, he knew that was not the divine will of God. Because he says, if it be possible, he knew that it was not possible. Later, as he leaves with the temple guards to go to the residence of the high priest, the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, the cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? His momentary recoil in his humanity comes into agreement with the divine will of God. The cup that my Father shall give me shall I not drink it. You know, I think that's a great lesson for us. Sometimes our prayer life and what we pray for is not the will of God. You know, sometimes in my life, in my own times of praying, when I'm praying for something, Sometimes in the actual praying, the Lord speaks to me, and my prayer changes to be, I think, more like what God's will is for that situation. And I think it's a great lesson. We come to the Lord in prayer, whatever it may be. And we need to begin to bring our prayer life more in agreement with the divine will of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, If we ask and pray in his will, we shall have answers to that prayer. And so we have here in this passage a great example for us. The Lord Jesus began to pray, began in that natural recoil of the flesh, but then he prays, Thy will be done. Now, our time is almost finished. I want to jump up a little bit to verse 9. Probably wish I had said something about verse 8. Um, just sort of a nice opportunity to skip over that difficult verse. Uh, verse 8, though he were a son, <coughs> he learned obedient, obedient to the things which he suffered. Just a few thoughts on that verse. It doesn't say he learned to be obedient. There is no resistance from an old nature to want him to be not to be obedient. One writer says something like this. His untested obedience that he had from eternity past 
now was tested as he took on flesh and became a man. He was tested by the things which he suffered. But look at verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation of all of them that obey him. Here we have the Lord Jesus. It says being made perfect. It doesn't mean when he came into this world, he wasn't perfect. He was perfect in the incarnation. He was perfect all, he was morally perfect all through his life. The word perfect means complete. But the idea here is when the Lord Jesus Christ left heaven's glory, when he left heaven's riches and for our sakes became poor, when he left heaven and all of its riches and all of its privileges and came into this world, and came to his own and his own received him not, when he came into this world and was submissive to the Father's will, that's when he became perfect. He became the perfect sacrifice. He became the perfect author of eternal salvation. He was perfect when he came into this world. But when he yielded himself to the perfect will of God as that obedient uh, servant, as that servant of uh, uh, Isaiah 53, then he becomes the, the perfect author of eternal salvation. And it says to all of them, This last part, where it says, all them that obey him. The word obey him means to be, to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean speak of something that works. It doesn't speak of some kind of sacrifice or something that you need to do, some effort that we have to do. It means coming by simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, um, I was speaking for a weekend in uh, Indianapolis on one occasion. I was in a home of a man who had been a missionary for many, many years in, in, in Korea. And uh, we had times to talk and chat. And he, he told me how to be saved. And he said he was raised in a church that never preached the gospel. And he had the idea that the way that you were saved by, he said he thought there was an imaginary rope. And you just climb up that rope higher and higher and higher. Hopefully you get eventually to heaven and to God. And so he would climb up, and some days they got higher and higher. And then he dropped down a little bit, and they go higher and drop down. And he could never get very far. And he would try with all this energy and all this all this strength to get higher on that road. One day he met a believer who was actually a student from the Mays Bible College. And he shared the gospel with him, and this man shared his story about the rope, what he was trying to do. And this young student, here's a little bit of an older man, and a young student, and the young student said to him, he said, Walter, there is no rope. There is no rope. And he said this. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's the work of obedience. That's the work of faith. All those that obey him. The work of faith believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the wonderful ministry of the Lord Jesus as a sympathetic high priest. We see the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden praying, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. We see the Lord Jesus before he came into this world. Lo, in the volume of the book is written of me, I come to do thy will, O God. And we are so thankful that he came into this world as an obedient son, as a perfect savior, as a loving, gracious, merciful savior. He went to the cross and laid down his life for our sins. And so, Father, we pray these things. We pray for this assembly here, this gathering of believers. We pray, Father, that you would use them in their efforts for you. You richly bless their efforts of reaching the loss, of building up the local body of Christ. And Father, we pray for blessing. We pray for your hand to be upon them. And so we pray this in Jesus' name.